in this very famous Ray Diodario photo of Justice Robert H. Jackson at the podium at Nuremberg, you will note on the right-hand shoulder of Justice Jackson is Thomas Dodd, the father of the speaker, Senator Christopher Dodd, who will be making remarks in the Supreme Court on February 15, 2005. Who was Thomas Dodd? Gentlemen, this is my chief secretary, Elsie Douglas. Elsie, this is Tom Dodd, who'll be deputy prosecutor. Well, it's nice to finally meet you, Miss Douglas. Pleasure. Colonel John Harlan Amon, who'll be head of interrogations. Miss Douglas. Colonel Telford Taylor, who'll be the liaison with the other prosecuting teams. Pleasure. All mine. And Colonel Robert Story, who'll be the head of our documents division. Pleased to meet you, ma'am. Colonel. Now that we're all here, let's go. leaders, political leaders. Well, what about the bankers and the industrialists who funded the Nazis? What about the soldiers and civilians who actually carried out the atrocities? We can't put the whole damn country on trial. But we do need to suggest the scope of the crimes. I want this trial to be the first of many. Well, then how about choosing a symbolic figurehead from each category? We cover the whole spectrum. And that way, no one group gets off scot-free. Makes sense. And if we win convictions, we can just keep right on prosecuting Nazis till the cows come home. And remember, we may also fail to win convictions in which case some or all of the defendants could go free. I'm still wrestling with the validity of this trial. Crimes committed during war have never been called crimes. Let's focus on existing law. What existing laws did the Nazis break? Well, they broke peace treaties, border treaties, certainly Geneva Convention and Hague Convention. Right. Every time they invaded a country, they broke a law. My fear is that at the end of the day, when all is said and done, this trial will be perceived as nothing more than triumph of superior might. The winner is exacting punishment on the losers. Our task is to make sure that this is not the triumph of superior might, but the triumph of superior morality. We're in a very interesting position here. We're in a position to fashion a future in which aggressive war will be dealt with as a crime. Here, here.
Mr. Dodd ended his presentation with this conclusion about the Nazi conspirators and their economic preparations of war. Their economic preparations formulated and applied with the ruthless energy of the defendant Gehring, with the cynical wizardry of the defendant Schacht, and the willing complicity of Funk, among others, were the indispensable first act in this heartbreaking tragedy which their aggression inflicted upon the world. millions of people who were brought into Germany to work in the factories that kept the war machine running. Here, American prosecutor Thomas Dodd presents evidence against defendant Fritz Sokol, who brought slave workers into Germany, and against Albert Speer, who used those workers as head of arms production for the last three years of the war. We shall show that the defendants Sokol and Speer are principally responsible for the formulation of the policy and for its execution. That the defendant Salcom, the Nazi plenipotentiary general for manpower, directed the recruitment, the deportation, and the allocation of foreign civilian labor. That he sanctioned and directed the use of force as the instrument of recruitment. And that he was responsible for the care and the treatment of the enslaved millions. That the defendant Speer, as Reich's Minister for Armaments and Munitions, Director of the organization TOF, and member of the Central Planning Board, bears responsibility for the determination of the numbers of foreign slaves required by the German war machine responsible for the decision to recruit by force and for the use under brutal, inhumane, and degrading conditions of foreign civilians and prisoners of war in the manufacture of armaments and, muni and munitions, the construction of fortifications, and in active military operations. Quoting from the text directly, the aim of this new gigantic labor mobilization is to use all the rich and tremendous sources conquered and secured for us by our fighting armed forces under the leadership of Adolf Hitler for the armament of the armed forces and also for the nutrition of the homeland. The raw materials as well as the fertility of the conquered territories and their human labor power are to be used completely and conscientiously to the profit of Germany and their allies. Now, Thomas Dodd, for those of you with long memories, of course, was a United States Senator from the state of Connecticut later. Uh, of course, he was a young man when that was delivered. His son, Chris Dodd, is currently a Senator from the state of Connecticut, and our guest commentator, Walter Rockler, was invited up to the University of Connecticut recently to celebrate really what we saw here, his, his Tom Dodd participation in the war crimes trial. It was in good part that, yeah. They, mm -hmm. they had opened up a new part of the university called the Dodd Center mm -hmm. and uh, combined it with a 50-year commemoration of the Nuremberg trial. Uh, now, how prevalent was it that ambitious young politicians would manage to get themselves on this prosecution team and be shown in, this was shown in newsreels across the country. There was a little resentment, well, maybe more than a little, you tell me, against Tom Dodd. He was very young. Uh, the word was he'd pull political strings to get there. Uh, how much of that went on, and was that true in this case? I don't know if it was true. I think Tom Dodd was uh, at, the, at the Department of Justice, which wouldn't have been so abnormal for moving into another role. Uh, there wasn't much of that in the time that I was around there. Most of the prosecutors came from the government, Treasury Department, Justice Department, and, uh, and uh, Labor Department. And uh, the only case of a politician I can recall was Charles LaFollette, who had been a representative from Indiana and who became a prosecutor at the Nuremberg Trials. Mm -hmm. I don't remember anybody who 
ever left the trials and went on to a political career except Tom Dodd. Yeah, one of the The Nazi leadership established a large number of satellite concentration camps in addition to the major ones. Mr. Dodd read briefly from a pre-trial interrogation of Defendant Speer. Quote, the fact was that we were anxious to use workers from concentration camps in factories and to establish small concentration camps near factories in order to use the manpower that was then available there. During the first three months of the trial, most of the attorneys in the American delegation kept current by reading the daily transcript of the proceeding. They would not actually attend many of the sessions, with one exception, Colonel Robert G. Story, the American Executive Trial Counsel. He attended the whole of almost every session until mid-January 1946 when he was succeeded by Thomas J. Dodd. Dodd, subject to Justice Jackson's general supervision, had the difficult task of directing American participation in the trial throughout the defense case, a taxing and difficult assignment. Thomas Dodd provided the principal cross-examination of some of the defendants in the dock. The, one of them was defendant Alfred Rosenberg, the Nazi philosopher, art collector, and minister for the occupied Eastern Territories. It's been described as one of the most revealing and devastating cross-examinations of the trial. During one part of the cross-examination, Dodd noted that five named persons on Rosenberg's staff were engaged in the elimination of Jews. Rosenberg began to talk about a decree. President Lawrence intervened. Will you answer the question first? Do you agree that these five people were engaged in exterminating Jews? Rosenberg then replied, yes. They knew about a certain number of liquidation of Jews. That I admit, and they have told me so. Or if they did not, I heard about it from other sources. Tom Dodd had made an excellent showing in the principal cross-examination of Rosenberg. This examination enhanced the growing reputation as executive trial counsel of Thomas Dodd. Another defendant cross-examined by Thomas Dodd was Walter Funk, Reich Minister of Economics and President of the Reichs Bank in a positive, but yet may still have a negative effect. And we're looking at United States Prosecutor Thomas Dodd, who destroyed any possible defense of Funk, particularly any denial of the nature of the deposits made by the SS in his bank. We've listened uh, to your testimony since late Friday afternoon. And uh, as we understand it, from your statements, you admit none of the charges made against you in the indictment in any, agree, in any degree, with possibly one exception. I'm not clear as to whether or not you were making an admission this morning with respect to your part in the persecution of the Jews. Would you tell us now whether or not you intended to admit your own guilt for the part that you played in the persecution of the Jews? I said this morning that I had a deep sense of guilt and a deep sense of shame about the things which were done to the Jews in Germany, and that at the time when the terror and violence began, I was involved in a strong conflict with my conscience. I felt I could almost say 
that a great injustice was being done. However, I did not feel guilty in respect to the indictment against me here. That is, that according to the indictment, I was guilty of crimes against humanity because I signed the directives for carrying out laws which had been issued by superior officers. Laws that had to be made so that the Jews would not be entirely deprived of their rights and so that they could be given some legal protection, at least in regard to compensation and settlement. I am admitting guilt against myself, a moral guilt, but not a guilt because I signed the directives for carrying out the laws. In any event, not a guilt against humanity. Now, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the gold in the Reichsbank. How much gold did you have on hand at the end of 1941, roughly? And don't give me any long story about it, because I'm not too interested. But I'm really trying to find out if you were short on gold in 1941. The gold reserve which I took over amounted to about 500 million Reichsmarks when I received the post of Schacht. Yes, all right. Please. It was increased in any substantial manner only by the Belgian gold, as far as I know. When did you start to do business with the SS, Mr. Funk? And geschäft business with the SS? I have never done that. Yes, sir, business with the SS. Are you sure about that? I want you to take this very seriously. It's about the end of your examination, and it's very important to you. Well, now, let's see. You were not ordinarily in the habit in the Reichsbank of accepting jewels, eyeglass spectacles, watches, cigarette cases, uh, pearls, diamonds, uh, gold dentures, were you? Did you ordinarily accept that sort of material for deposit in your bank? Nein. Well, there could be no question, in my opinion, that the bank had no right to do that, because these things were supposed to be delivered to an entirely different place. If I am correctly informed about the legal position, these things were supposed to be delivered to the Reich office for precious metals and not to the Reichsbank. Diamonds, jewels, and precious stones were not the concern of the Reichsbank because it was not a place of sale for these things. And, in my opinion, if the Reichsbank did that, then it was unlawful. That's exactly right. If that happened, then the Reichsbank committed an illegal act. The Reichsbank was not authorized to do that. I asked you yesterday, and I ask you again now, did you ever hear of anybody depositing his gold dentures in a bank? for safekeeping. You saw that film and you saw the gold bridge work or mouth plate, didn't you? And the other uh, dental work. Certainly nobody ever deposited that with a bank. Isn't that a fact? Was die, das Bild mit den Zähnen anbelangt, so is As far as the teeth are concerned, this is a special case. Where these teeth came from, I do not know. It was not reported to me, nor do I know what was done with those teeth. I am convinced that items of this sort, when they were delivered to the Reichsbank, had to be turned over to the Office for Precious Metals, for the Reichsbank was not a place where gold was worked. Neither do I know whether the Reichsbank even had the technical facilities to work with this metal. I do not know about that. Now, not only did uh, people not deposit gold teeth, but they never deposited eyeglass uh, rims, did they, such as you saw in the picture? That is right. These things are, of course, no regular deposits. That goes without saying. That does go without saying. Another defendant cross-examined by Thomas Dodd was Balder von Schirach the Hitler youth leader and gall lighter of Vienna. Another defendant cross-examined by Thomas Dodd was Arthur Seisenkort, administrator in three German occupied countries, being Austria, Poland, and the Netherlands. 
The closing arguments of the prosecution concerning the accused organizations were the last stage of the trial before the final statements of the individual defendants. On behalf of the United States, Thomas Dodd made a general presentation on the organization. This was followed by a presentation by Brigadier General Telford Taylor directed to the general staff and the high command. U.S. Prosecutor Thomas Dodd's summary of the organization's crimes. The cut between the beginning and the ending of Dodd's speech is original. The United States Army cameraman who filmed it knew just when to turn on his camera by waiting patiently for the word, finally, to capture the end of Dodd's summary. President, since the 20th day of November, 1945, this International Military Tribunal has been an almost continual session. In these many months, a record of more than 15,000 pages has been compiled. Over 300,000 affidavits have been submitted, about 3,000 documents have been offered, and oral testimony has been heard from some 200 witnesses. This great mass of evidence, oral and written, almost exclusively of German origin, has established beyond question the commission of the crimes of criminal conspiracy, aggressive war, mass murder, slave labor, racial and religious persecutions, and brutal mistreatment of millions of innocent people. The four prosecuting powers have indicted and hold responsible for these frightful crimes as individuals the 22 defendants named in the indictment. But the four prosecuting powers recognizing that the 22 individual defendants could not by themselves alone accomplish the execution of these enormous crimes have also named in the indictment the Nazi organizations as the principal media by and through which these transgressions were affected. These organizations, some Nazi created, some Nazi perverted, were the agencies upon which the defendants relied and through which they operated for the accomplishment of their criminal purposes over the complacent people of Germany and over the conquered peoples of Europe. The named organizations fall into two classes. In the first class are those which are peculiarly Nazi creations having no counterpart outside the Nazi regime and which had no intrinsically legitimate purpose. This group includes the political Leiter, the SA and the SS. In the second class are those which existed in one form or another before the Nazi regime, but which were corrupted by the Nazis. This group includes the Reich Cabinet, the High Command and General Staff and the Gestapo. As to this second class, it is not our contention that the institutions themselves were basically criminal, but rather that they became criminal under Nazi domination. Although by its very nature as a secret political police system, the Gestapo was the most easily adopted to criminal purposes and became one of the most effective of all instruments of Nazi criminality. It would be a mistake to consider these organizations named in the indictment as isolated, independently functioning aggregations of persons, each pursuing separate tasks and objectives. They were all a part of and essential to the police state planned by Hitler and perfected by his clique into the most absolute tyranny of modern times. That police state was the political Frankenstein of our era which brought terror and fear to Germany and spread horror and death throughout the world. The leadership core of the Nazi party was its body. The Reich cabinet its head, its powerful arms were the Gestapo and the SA, and when it strode over Europe, its legs were the armed forces and the SS. It was Hitler and his cohorts who created this police state monster, and it brought Germany to shame and the nations of Europe to ruin. It would likewise be erroneous to view the structure of this police system as something casual or its growth and development as normal political phenomena. 
for it was planned from the earliest days by the conspirators. The Nazi old fighters had a design for despotism. They built the SA at the outset <clears throat> as a private band of strong arm men to wield the club against the political opponent and the whip against the Jew. They established the SS as the dread guard of the Fuhrer and of themselves. When they seized power, they abolished police protection and substituted police persecution as the mission of the Gestapo. They wiped out all semblance of free government and set themselves up in the Reich cabinet with plenary powers. They depraved the highest traditions of military ethics and substituted willing tools for ranking men at arms. They obliterated all other political parties and fastened on the German people a political straitjacket in the form of the leadership corps. Deprive the Nazi conspirators of these organizations and they could have never have accomplished their criminal aim. Take away the SA and they would have lost the mastery of the streets. Take away the SS and they would have had no concentration camp system very anonymity which the Nazis intended to give to crime by the use of these organizations plagues us to the very end of this trial. After these proceedings are concluded, this same organizational anonymity will plague the Allied powers in seeking to bring to book those who are responsible for these terrible offenses. It is a sobering fact that the vast majority of the crimes committed in the names of these organizations must go unpunished. And so it was indictments of the organizations, a question of guilt by association. This is defendant Franz von Papen. And there is an interesting footnote to the Nuremberg trial which was set forth in the memoirs of von Papen. Thomas Dodd, from the negotiations in London, through the end of the Nuremberg trial. He acted as one of the principal assistants to Justice Robert H. Jackson, from one of his foremost leading deputies to the executive trial counsel after the departure of Robert's story. Thomas Dodd played an extraordinary part in the history of the Nuremberg trial. We look forward to hearing the comments of his son, Senator Christopher Dodd.